And the president was trying to continue the facade that it was somehow a group of rogue Cuban Americans that did this and not so much the presidential yeah. order. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we, we kept up the facade. Now, whether he was fooled by it, it, it may be that he felt that it was to his advantage uh, to accept this facade. I, I have no idea what he was thinking. Castro, was he aware that this was a, you were down there on behalf of the president? No. Or, no. Well, I mean, maybe he was, but he didn't act like it, and we certainly didn't act sure. like it. We were, I think, four private attorneys who had volunteered to be the group to negotiate with him. The way I got to, to Cuba was that <clears throat> Castro got word that he was going to be embarrassed because he was getting a lot of junk. So I'll never forget it. I called Bob Kennedy from, the, uh, from a phone booth on the pier. I said, Bobby, you got a little present, you got a little problem here. He said, what is it? And I told him. And in his typical fashion, he said, well, Barrett, I guess you better go down there and explain to Fidel why he's getting all that junk. <laughs> <laughs> I gulped. <laughs> so I would, next thing I knew, I was on a plane for uh, Cuba. Fidel comes out to meet me. and. Uh, we talk, he goes off, and his, I asked his lieutenant where Hemingway's home is, and he came back and said, uh, Fidel wants to take you. I didn't know where he was taking me, but he wanted to take me, apparently, to, to uh, Hemingway's home. So off we piled into um, Jeeps guns going out here and there and so forth. Off we went to Hemingway's home. And uh, it was locked. And uh, he was not happy, but he, he had people scour the neighborhood and they came across a guy who'd worked for Hemingway for like 20 years. And this guy was great. He had a key, he let us in. He had worked for Hemingway for many, many years. And he's spent the afternoon showing us around Hemingway's house and the, the, the weight on the wall in the bathroom and, uh, and uh, why he slept on a slat, slate, slate, because of his, he snored and his first wife was down the hall. <laughs> and, just a million details. And we ended up in the kitchen where Hemingway had a TV set where he used to watch the fights. And we all sat around on things. And um, finally it started to get dark, so we decided we had to go back down and we all clambered back in the Jeeps. And we started back and uh, as we got about halfway back, off in a, off you, off in a few, far distant, you could hear, Fidel, Fidel, it's Fidel. And people pouring out of little homes and so forth saying, Fidel, Fidel. And uh, Fidel told us that um, he had built these villages and that these were all people who were admirers of his, as was obvious. And um, <clears throat> so we continued after a while on to the ship which had arrived and which had only unpacked one goods. And that was baby food. As far as you can see, literally tons, I read later, tons of baby food. He would not be embarrassed with all this damn baby food. And <clears throat> shortly thereafter, he announced that <clears throat> the prisoners could begin leaving the next morning. And uh, so I spent a rather drunken night 
In Havana. In Havana. Yeah. Smoking cigars. And uh, flew out on a plane the next morning, filled. Every seat was taken with a prisoner except for one, and that was the one I was in. And you know, this was one of the most emotional experiences of my entire life. There was not a sound on that plane, not a sound on that plane as we sat at the runway and he revved up the engine and so forth and we just sat there and we couldn't leave because first a, a, a Russian plane was in the way and then there were other things that kept them there and at one point the captain of the ship came roaring out to it, yelling my name, saying, Mr. Prettyman, Mr. Prettyman, I'm just dead in the water. And I said, what in the world's the matter? And he said, he, he has announced that the, some of the families can go back, as well as the prisoners. And they're going to go on my ship. He said, I don't have any supplies for these people. I don't have, my, these people are giving birth and they are dying and they are doing all kinds of things and I don't have enough blankets and enough this and that and, and drugs and so forth. He said, I can't do it. So I calmed him down and I told him as soon as I got to Florida I would send back everything that he could possibly need for his ship. So he moved off and finally the ship went down the runway and it's funny to this day I get emotional about this but as it left the ground the ship went the plane went berserk they grabbed me and kissed me they hugged me it was it was just incredible. They went berserk. And I remember particularly one young prisoner, I thought he was way too young to be a prisoner, but apparently they didn't have any trouble become, becoming soldiers. <clears throat> he grabbed me and he said, Mr. Prettyman, I want you to know <clears throat> that every night that I was a prisoner, I had a dream, and the dream was that I was in line to get off the plane, and it never left the ground. <clears throat> he said, you turn that awful nightmare into a nice dream. You made it all come true. Whew. Well, <laughs> anyway, um, that's the way it was all the way back to the U.S. You, you caught up with President Kennedy later. No, I didn't catch up. He called me. Okay. He called me to uh, thank me, and it was Christmas Day. <laughs> Gentlemen of the brigade, uh, I need not tell you how happy I am. In December 1962, States, President Kennedy spoke to the surviving members of the Bay of Pigs. What a profound impression, your conduct during some of the most difficult days and months they had been ransomed for $53 million worth of food and medicine. What a profound impression your conduct made. And I can assure you that it is the strongest wish of the people of this country that Cuba shall one day be free again. Uh, and that's when that kid who was a Bear Pigs prisoner said I <clears throat> made his dream come true. Mm -hmm.